welcome to Dissecting Philosophy with Dr. MacDonald. In this episode, I'll be reading and discussing the sections of the scholars and of the poets in Nietzsche's The Spoke Zarathustra. I also have a wee discussion of some examples of Gilles Deleuze, 20th century French philosopher's view of philosophers, as well as a wee brief discussion of Novalis's poem Hymn to the Night, as well as a wee brief discussion of Nietzsche's views of poetry and its relation into Instagram in contemporary society. So let's get started. Of scholars, as I lay asleep, a sheep ate at the ivy wreath upon my head, ate and said, Zarathustra is no longer a scholar. It spoke and went away stiffly and proud. A child told me of it. I like to lie here where children play, beside the broken wall among thistles and red poppies. To children I am still a scholar, and to thistles and red poppies too. They are innocent even in their wickedness. But to the sheep I am no longer a scholar, thus my fate will have it. Blessed be my fate, for this is the truth. I have left the house of scholars and slammed the door behind me. Too long did my soul sit hungry at their table. I have not been schooled, as they have, to crack knowledge as one cracks nuts. I love freedom and the air of a fresh soil. I would sleep on oxkins rather than on their indignities and respectabilities. I am too hot and scorched by my own thought. It is often about to take my breath away. Then I have to get into the open air and away from all dusty rooms. But they sit cool in the cool shade. They want to be mere spectators in everything. And they take care not to sit where the sun burns upon the steps. Like those who stand in the street and stare at people passing by. So they too wait and stare at thoughts that others have thought. If one takes hold of them, they involuntarily raise a dust like sacks of flour, but who could guess that their dust derived from corn and from the golden joy of summer fields? When they give themselves out as wise, their little sayings and truths make me shiver, their wisdom often smells as if it came from the swamp, and indeed I have heard the frog croak in it. They are clever, they have cunning fingers. What is my simplicity compared with their diversity? Their fingers understand all threading and knitting and weaving. Thus they weave the stockings of the spirit. They are excellent clocks, only be careful to wind them up properly. Then they tell the hour without error and make a modest noise in doing so. They work like mills and rammers, just throw seed corn into them. They know how to grind corn small and make white dust of it. They keep a sharp eye upon one another and do not trust one another as well as they might. Inventive in their small slynesses, they lie in wait for those whose wills go upon lame feet. They lie in wait like spiders. I have seen how carefully they prepare their poisons. They always put on protective gloves. They also know how to play with loaded dice, and I found them playing so zealously that they were sweating. We are strangers to one another, and their virtues are even more opposed to my taste than are their falsehoods and loaded dice. And when I lived among them, I lived above them. They grew angry with me for that. They did not want to know that someone was walking over their heads, so they put wood and dirt and rubbish between their heads and me. Thus they muffled the sound of my steps. And from then on, the most scholarly heard me the worst. They put all the faults and weaknesses of mankind between themselves and me. They call this a false flooring in their houses. But I walk above their heads with my thoughts in spite of that. And even if I should walk upon my own faults, I should still be above them and their heads. For men are not equal, thus speaks justice. And what I desire, they may not desire. Thus spoke Zarathustra. So immediately kicking off the section, we have this really strange image of a sheep eating off a laurel wreath from Zarathustra's head, and that whole 
discussion of not being a scholar anymore. And so Nietzsche is really touching upon an autobiographical element within the story in which Nietzsche himself is discussing the way in which he left academic life due to his own illness. And so it's this whole story within Nietzsche's life that he was a professor at Basel University and then had to leave due to illness. And what was thought to be the illness was dysentery picked up from the Austro-Hungarian War, I think it was, in which he served in as a medic. And so it was a lingering condition on from all that. And so he lived as well, moving around from southern France, around Switzerland into northern Italy, moving around in that nice little area in Europe. And so it's that whole point in which he's saying here, I'm no longer an academic anymore. And people wouldn't think of me as an academic either. And then we get into the whole argument about academics and painting a very dusty picture, let's say, of what academics and scholars actually do. So we have ultimately scholars sitting in dusty rooms, as he says, then what is their relationship into knowledge? They want to have this lovely relationship into only sitting down and eating a bag of nuts. So a pleasurable experience when you're just having a little small portion of it that you can enjoy and you can get tucked into. And then what also do they do is just sit and stare at others and their thoughts and really have no thought for themselves. So then we really get two aspects out of the whole image of scholars that's made up is that on the one hand, they want knowledge and the consumption of knowledge to be a pleasant experience. And on the other hand, they don't really have any thoughts for themselves. All what they do is read and look at the thoughts of other people and then sort of regurgitate what other people say. And of course, you can get that in academia as a great option, especially when you look at secondary books and how much secondary books have all been written on philosophers, all fantastic introductory books. So a little bit on the defensive side of that, of course, would be to say, well, it's very well not having your own original thoughts here, but a good secondary discussion or an introduction to a text can be very beneficial for somebody new to a field or discipline, whatever it is, and allows for people to get their foot in the door, even if what the author is saying is not original in their own given way. But, of course, Nietzsche is not wanting knowledge just to be in this nice, easy to digest, open the door for everybody else. He wants it to be in this very creative, everybody has their own dynamic thoughts about things and wanting people to think for themselves. And hence why you have the whole idea of an academic and their wisdom, as he says, ultimately stinking like a swamp because they have absolutely no creativity. And so their own ideas are just stinky in a way. They're not fresh because the other image that we also have that's painted as well is one of Zarathustra himself out of the dusty rooms into the fresh open air. And not only that, then we also have the idea of knowledge as well, of being challenging in a way, and for your own view to be challenging the norm, and not for it to be pleasurable in any given way, and for you to tackle hot topics and hot issues. That whole discussion there of they don't want to touch the hot steps of the sun, so they don't really want to touch any of the dangerous or hot topics for academics. They just want it all to be nice and lovey-dovey. And then we also have the image of an academic being very devious and cunning and all just wanting to have a relation into their own power and how much they can enhance their own position and waiting for somebody else to stumble therefore to then take on that position themselves and therefore enhance their reputation and enhance how much their money they're getting and so on. Whilst Nietzsche himself is 
painting a nice image for his own life right now out with all that academic life and to say well they're stuck in the dusty rooms but actually i'm out and about having a wee walk in the fields going about in the mountains and so on enjoying life and thinking about issues that actually academics don't and what my issues are doing is touching upon challenging thought-provoking issues that most people don't even touch shouldn't that be what knowledge is all about and of course Nietzsche's got the point here of well of course that's exactly what academics should be doing as well and we should be taking people to task for not challenging ideas and touching upon a wanting to deal with hot topics or potentially even dangerous or challenging topics as well everything should be open for discussion and debate because the moment that you start to lose all the element of debate and discussion is precisely when you then run into the whole ideas of fascism and totalitarianism which of course nobody wants you always want to have that open discussion and debate to go on in a very democratic fashion so Nietzsche is really saying that in order for academic life and scholars to have worth and value in what they're saying is not simply just to sta sit and stare, as he says, at other people's thoughts and all take it in, but rather to then use what you've learned in order to apply it to society and then how does such and such issue or topic within a given field and within a given discipline how can we apply this to contemporary society how can we make it work how can we make it function or rather than just to sit there and write about the umpteenth text upon a given already popular subject matter the whole idea in Nietzsche is therefore like no let's use this let's challenge this maybe even let's challenge the whole idea of the person in the first place and what is a good example of actually a way in which an academic does challenge how we think upon at least the traditional models within philosophers is Gilles Deleuze who's a 20th century French philosopher and Deleuze has some really interesting ideas and discussions about philosophers that go against the grain basically between what's all been set up at the accepted image of them and that would be great of course because that's exactly what Nietzsche would want us to do is just not there sit and accept a given view of how we should view things even when it comes to viewing other people but to then to then challenge that and a very brief example of the way in which Deleuze challenges how we think about people is a two examples is that of Spinoza and Leibniz. So Spinoza and Leibniz are traditionally treated within philosophy as rationalist philosophers, therefore emphasizing the importance of reason. And this is opposed to empiricism, which emphasizes a very much more scientific approach to things, in which we have the British empiricist philosophers of John Locke and David Hume. But what's interesting for how Deleuze reads Spinoza and Leibniz is that he focuses on the empirical qualities within both their philosophies. And so you just can't generalize one particular person within adhering completely to the idea of a school of thought. So it's important, I think, here to say that Nietzsche is not arguing for a complete eradication of all knowledge altogether and everyone just runs around with their own opinions thinking about things as they will i'm right everybody else is wrong because i think this is not what he's arguing for it's rather to say well what we need to do is think about how we can develop our own thoughts our own opinions and realize at times that what we need to do is challenge and precisely don't be afraid of challenging as well the norms that are within society and don't become comfortable knowledge shouldn't be something that's relaxing knowledge should be something that's challenging and challenging not only our own thoughts and the ideas about things but also challenging others as well moving on to the next section then 
of poets. Since I have known the body better, said Zarathustra to one of his disciples, the spirit has been only figuratively spirit to me, and all that is intransitory, that too has been only an image. I heard you say that once before, answered the disciple, and then you added, but the poets lie too much. Why did you say that poets lie too much? Why? said Zarathustra. You ask why? I am not one of those who may be questioned about their why. Do my experiences date from yesterday? It is a long time since I experienced the reasons for my opinions. Should I not have to be a barrel of memory if I wanted to carry my reasons too about with me? It is already too much for me to retain even my opinions, and many a bird has flown away. And now and then I found in my dove coat an immigrant creature which is strange to me and which trembles when I lay my hand upon it. Yet, yeah, what did Zarathustra once say to you? That poets lie too much. But Zarathustra too is a poet. Do you now believe that he spoke the truth? Why do you believe it? The disciple answered, I believe in Zarathustra. But Zarathustra shook his head and smiled. Belief does not make me blessed, he said. Least of all belief in myself. But granted that someone has said in all seriousness that the poets lie too much. He is right. We do lie too much. We know too little and are bad learners. So we have to lie. So immediately kicking off this section, we have a relation into Goethe's Faust. It's the initial quote here that's been paraphrased. Since I have known the body better, said Zarathustra to one of his disciples, the spirit has been only figuratively spirit to me, and all that is intransitory, that too has only been an image. And then, nicely at the back, as well in the notes, we see that this is coming from the final mystic chorus of Goethe's Faust Part 2, and there's going to be references to this as we go along in this section. And this is the translation of the section from Faust. It has at the back here in the notes. All that is transitory is but an image. The unattainable here becomes reality. The indescribable here is done. The eternal womanly draws up upward. And so for Goethe as well, we see that the whole idea of things being intransitory and being an image that then enables us to go into this whole metaphysics and idealistic state upon things much greater and grander than what the world itself is. But what Nietzsche's picking up on and sort of poking a bit of fun at is the whole idea of this move above everything that happens within poetry of this whole relation and becoming greater and moving above the world itself and therefore having a sense of belief as well in something that is greater than the world and moving past that as well when he has that whole initial wee discussion about belief how do i know what i believe in the past is he says it's all completely gone and therefore it's making fun of the fact that the very idea of becoming something more than a temporary thing in itself is laughable because forgetfulness takes place and how are we able to have a whole idea of something that's perfect when we're not going to be able to have an idea of what perfect is because our whole idea in the first place of something that is perfect will be affected by our memory and so he's saying here really belief is not something that's persistent it's something that's not strong at all in fact belief lies to us because belief is something that's very fragmented based upon our memory and forgetfulness and hence why he's sort of just sort of shaking his head at his own disciple because he wants his own disciple to not believe in him in the concrete sense of following around as you do in the whole sort of master student relationship but he wants his own student to realize basically the flaws of his own belief in believing in him in the first place. Continuing on then, and which of us poets has not adulterated his wine? 
Many a poisonous hotchpotch has been produced in our cellars. Many an indescribable thing has been done there. And because we know little, the poor in spirit delight our hearts, especially when they are young women. And we desire even those things the old women tell one another in the evening. We call that the eternal womanly in us. And we believe in the people and its wisdom, as if there were a special secret entrance to knowledge which is blocked to him who has learned anything. But all poets believe this, that he who, lying in the grass or in the lonely bowers, pricks up his ears, catches a little of the things that are between heaven and earth. And if they experience tender emotions, the poets always think that nature herself is in love with them and that she creeps up to their ears to speak secrets and amorous flattering words into them. Of this they boast and pride themselves before all mortals. Alas, there are so many things between heaven and earth of which only the poets have let themselves dream, and especially above heaven, for all gods are poets' images. Poets' surreptitiousness, truly it draws us ever upward, that is, to cloudland, we set our motley puppets on the clouds and then call them gods and supermen, and are they not light enough for these insubstantial seats, all these gods and supermen? Alas, how weary am I of all the unattainable that is supposed to be reality? Alas, how weary am I of the poets? When Zarathustra had spoken thus, his disciple was angry with him, but kept silent, and Zarathustra too kept silent, and his eye had turned within him, as if he were gazing into the far distance, and at length he sighed and drew a deep breath. And so then we have Nietzsche say, well, what did poets exactly do? They unlock the door, in a sense, as he says, or at least allow us a little glimpse into something that's meant to be secret and hidden from us. And if only we could therefore attain that little hidden secret that's there. And so what is, of course, is this is a much higher, greater intimacy with the world and with nature itself on this sort of idealistic plane. Or as he says, fantastic line as well for cloud land they create this lovely cloud land you just imagine all that lovely fluffiness everywhere around us and poets get so enraptured by nature herself as he says that then they think they're having this intimate secret relationship with the world and therefore they then create this idealistic images and ideals and so forth that everyone want to attain but then we have that fantastic line of course how weary am i of all the unattainable that is supposed to be reality and it's such a fantastic line as well because we could apply that precisely to everyday life in the sense of how much is that line applicable of I'm weary of all the unattainable that is supposed to be reality because that is what reality is in an everyday sense as well for us. It's always in the unattainable, only for the select few of having a fantastic car, having a fantastic home, having a fantastic job. And it's like what Nietzsche is saying, how weary do we just become of all this idealistic images that are just placed upon us? In this like cloud land reality that's being presented towards us. And so for an example as well at this point, even though we're not finished the section, I think it's good to slip it in here. It's for the way in which also poetry enables us not only to an ex sublime experience in with nature, but also here we can say there's a relationship into the way in which this whole relation into nature then reveals itself also into a divine relationship with God that also takes place within certain poets and ideas. And a good example of that, of course, is in Novalis in his Hymns to the Night, in which we've got a great wee quote, chunky wee quote as well, from a book by Gisela H. Kreglinger from the book Storied Revelations 
Parables, Imagination, and George MacDonald's Christian Fiction. So it's a nice little bit in Novalis in the midst of all this. And it says, in the first hymn, Novalis asks of the night, What holdest thou under thy mantle? That with hidden power affects my soul. In hymns 4 and 5, Novalis answers this rhetorical question. The night became the mighty womb of revelation. This revelation is centered for Novalis around the birth, life, death and resurrection of Christ, which he reflects upon in the last four hymns. Novalis writes, Inconsumable stands the cross, victory flag of our race, and in, in death eternal life was made known. You are death and thou first makest us whole. Novalis' fascination with the night and death is not with deaths as such as Wolfe and Giorgio Spinner have argued, for example. Rather, it is because of Christ's death and resurrection that one's own experience of suffering and loss can become the very place we encounter God. In Christ, one's own experience of loss and suffering can be redeemed. This is why Novalis urges his readers again and again to go down into the holy and blessed night. This journey downward into the night and his longing after death is really a longing after home, which is for Novalis closely connected with his faith in the beloved Jesus. Which is a fantastic example there as well for Novalis' hymn to the night. In the way in which you have specifically the way nature takes upon greater significance and night within nature as well and the whole relationship between night and day that happens within the poem and set poems that then you have that greater significance into the whole divine and the whole relation into christ and god and it's from all this we can understand in a much deeper sense as well the way in which we have the relation into nature taking upon a greater significance and then not only having this secret relationship with nature but also then drawn us ever upward as Nietzsche says into cloudland. Continuing on then I am of today and of the has been he said then but there is something in me that is of tomorrow and of the day after tomorrow and of the shall be. I have grown weary of the poets, the old and the new. They all seem to me superficial and shallow seas. They have not thought deeply enough, therefore their feeling has not plumbed the depths. A little voluptuousness and a little tedium, that is all their best ideas have ever amounted to. All their harp jangling is to me so much coughing and puffing of phantoms. What have they ever known of the ardour of towns? They are not clean enough for me either. They all disturb their waters so that they may seem deep. And in that way, they would like to show themselves reconcilers. But to me, they remain mediators and meddlers and mediocre and unclean men. Ah, indeed, I cast my net into their sea and hope to catch fine fish. But I always draw an old god's head. Thus the sea gave a stone to the hungry man, and they themselves may well originate from the sea. To be sure, one finds pearls in them, then they themselves are all the more like hard shellfish, and instead of the soul I have often found in them salty slime. They learned vanity too from the sea. Is the sea not the peacock of peacocks? It unfurls its tail even before the ugliest of buffaloes, it never wearies of its lace fan of silver and satin. The buffalo looks on insolently, his soul like the sand, yet more like the thicket, but most like the swamp. What are beauty and sea and peacock ornaments to him? I speak this parable to the poets. Truly their spirit itself is the peacock of peacocks and a sea of vanity. The poet's spirit wants spectators, even if they are only buffaloes. But I have grown weary of this spirit, and I see the day coming when it will grow weary of itself. Already I have seen the poets transformed. I have seen them direct their glance upon themselves. I have seen the penitence of the spirit appearing. They grew out of the poets. Thus spoke Zarathustra. So, random off the section, then we don't have a very good image of poets at all. 
that's made up here because ultimately he's saying poetry attempts to try and be deep and think about deep topics and deep subjects about things but ultimately it's all just an appearance and it all remains very much at surface level. Ultimately there's nothing really thought provoking or deep within what they say. And then we get an interesting little psychological jab in there as well. Ultimately say well why do they even do poetry in the first place is because they have a sense of egoism and vanity about what they do and they want ultimately other people to just stand around and listen to them. And so they have this whole sort of need for other people to be around them and have that whole self-congratulatory aspect of it all. Like, yes, you are good. Yes, you are fantastic. That is an amazing thing that you're saying. The peacock of peacocks. Fantastic image there as well. And what type of spectators they want. Any, he says, even if it's the buffalo, which is the whole idea of just any old person will do. It doesn't matter. Just any old person, as long as they're there and sit there and applaud them and say they're absolutely fabulous, they wouldn't care what sort of person it would be. And then he says, well, if they actually looked at themselves and had a really deep look and reflection, then they'd probably become incredibly penitent about what they would be as a person. And you can't really see this whole image of being a peacock of peacocks really lasting. If they only really glanced upon themselves and reflected more, then they'd realize precisely their own hollowness, basically. And their own vanity really doesn't really amount to anything whatsoever. And we have that sort of interest and crossover with contemporary society and really Instagram and that whole idea of peacocks of peacocks of people these days, we should say, applies much greater than just poets. And wanting an audience is much greater than just poets as well because suddenly you post something on Instagram. It's not just wanting a select little audience who's come to listen to whatever you've got to say. It's just then allowing for the entire world to take in whatever picture it is along with whatever little caption and so forth. And it's that whole idea of peacocks of peacocks. Such a great concept for this section as well. Then we could say for the Nietzsche, if only they would look upon themselves and think more deeply. But that's of course the problem, let's say. There maybe isn't much deep going on within most people and most people don't care about deep thoughts or having deeper thoughts about things. And everybody likes to be on the surface. And I think that's what Nietzsche as well takes into account when you deal with the whole idea of herd mentality as well as everybody just except and everything at the surface value and face value for everything. People like to run around like that as well. But it's just interesting that he does see that if only everybody had a wee bit more of that self-reflection and self-critical look upon themselves, it would be overall much healthier approach for everybody to have rather than to trying to run around all the time and be vain. So overall, we don't really have that much of a great image of either academics or poets that comes out of both sections because one of the main things that comes out of it as well is why is that the case because academics on the one hand all what they do is sit and wait and look at other people's thoughts and don't actually produce anything for themselves and on the other hand for poets all what we have is just relation into nature and therefore getting into a nice sublime relationship with nature and into cloudland, as Nietzsche says. But really, we don't have anything deep that's going on, anything thought-provoking. Everything very much rests at the surface. And so in both cases, we have Nietzsche arguing for a very much philosophical approach, arguing for critical thinking about things, and for us to develop our own ideas, our own beliefs, as well as showing the fragility of that belief at the same time. And of course, are all academics completely thoughtless and don't have any ideas? Are all poets completely useless and all vain? No, in both cases, because we can see in the academic side of things for Nietzsche that in order to be a good academic, one has to ultimately tackle challenging and dangerous topics and so forth. 
and respond to contemporary problems. And in a similar way, this applies to also poets as well, not to simply just give us a lovely description of nature and a relation into the divine and so forth, but to have an actual depth to the poetry and have it similarly respond to contemporary problems. So there's a way in which Nietzsche would be much more an advocate of, let's say, political poetry. Many thanks for listening to the episode. I hope you enjoyed my discussion of the sections of the scholars and of the poets in Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Feel free to check out my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash dissecting philosophy. I could be also found on Twitter at I am a rubber man. And also feel free to drop me a wee email at my address dissectingphilosophy at gmail.com. Many thanks for listening and I hope you'll join me next time.